Soul Soaring Socks and Hems, 343, 1, 2, and 4. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Lion of glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Lion of glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for Thy Spirit of life, who has shown us a Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with Thy love. May it so be we're far from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Amen. Next song be page number 29. We'll sing one, two, and four again. Page number 29. Alas, did my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die? Would he sacred head for such a worm as I at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rode away it was there by faith I received by sight and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy 
on the day. Well, right across the page, number 30, we'll sing all, we'll sing the first three verses. Page number 30. What, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. but the blood of Jesus. For my part in this I see nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea nothing but the blood of Jesus, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. We chapter number four in the book of Jonah. We're going to pick up in verses uh, six through eight, and we're dealing with uh, the anger of Jonah. Verse six says, And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm. <laughs> when the morning rose the next day and it smoked the gourd that it withered, and it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Well, you know, when, when we, we look at this and as we... We left off, we found that God had uh, turned from what He had planned for uh, Nineveh because they had humbled themselves and had repented of their evil ways and came to, <laughs> to God for, uh, for His forgiveness. And that just literally made Jonah mad. 
because he knew that God wouldn't do what he had claimed he would do. Now, you know, we saw uh, that it could have been that uh, perhaps Jonah's ego was hurt a little bit. And, you know, what would it look like for me who came crying destruction and yet no destruction came? I would look like some false prophet. And in the eyes of people, uh, perhaps Jonah was just mad because he wanted to see the Ninevites destroyed because he didn't like the people. Because, well, for one, they had a part, they killed his father. And, uh, and these things. But we look, as we look here in verse 6, uh, the, well, in verse 5, he had made a shelter and for himself and uh, he sat there in its shade and it was a temporary solution but the Lord would provide an even better one for the pouting prophet so we find the Lord uh, there in verse 6 uh, in a marvelous act of grace towards the prophet he prepared a gourd that grew over Jonah and provided shade for him. Now, this in you know in considering you got to consider him where you are, or where he was. He was up on top of, of a, a ridge overlooking down overlooking the city and things, and uh, it was rocky and those things. And uh, yet, God once again prepared something that would to be used for the benefit of Jonah and uh, it grew and it provided shelter for him or shade for him some believe the plant to be the castor oil plant with its big leaves that are common in that area others think it was a climbing gourd that may have covered the booth or the shelter that he had made and the shade this plant provided did something nothing else could do in the story of Jonah we find that this plant as we look there it says at the last sentence of verse number 6 so Jonah was exceeding glad of the gold that's the only place that we find in the book of Jonah in these four chapters where Jonah was happy. He was exceedingly glad with the plant. He comfortably sat on the hillside hoping to see God change his mind about sparing the Assyrians or possibly hoping that the Assyrians' repentance was not sincere repentance. It was more, uh, their actions were more show and what they said was more of lip service. But we find the same God in verse 7 who appointed or prepared the gourd now prepared a worm that would smoke the gourd or would eat into the gourd and things and cause it to die. Why would God provide the plant only to have it taken away by the worm? You know, I'm sure that that was probably uh, Jonah's could be a thought in his mind. But as, as we, as the readers and things, we see in all of this, God is trying to teach Jonah some lessons. So we find, obviously, God cared about Jonah's spiritual condition more than his physical comfort. 
He wanted Jonah to recognize that his anger was unjustified. He didn't have any right to be angry because God spared the people of, of Nineveh. And that his bitterness towards God and the Assyrians were affecting him. Jonah was blind to what should have been his priorities and was acting hypocritically by obsessing over his own physical comfort. You know, at this point in the ball game, it really didn't matter from one, one extreme to the other. He went from being angry and wanting to die to be exceedingly glad now he's going back again. Verse 7 emphasizes how God was in control of, of this narrative. He appointed the fish. He appointed the gourd. Now He appointed the worm to do the bidding that He wanted it to do. So in this, the, the, the worm in verse 7 now smote the gourd and it withered. So it brings us into verse 8. Verse 8 it says, And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a valiant east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. So here in verse 8, God had one more appointment for Jonah. And He appointed this uh, valument or an, a very intense or strong scorching east wind. Not only, it, it wasn't a cool breeze, but it was a very strong, intense, hot wind that came and blew upon Jonah. And this is a phenomenon in this region that is known as a Sirocco, which can quickly raise the temperature by as much as 20 degrees Fahrenheit. We see the sun fell directly on Jonah. So when we, we look at this, we find that perhaps like this was the middle of the day where no matter where Jonah went, the sun was there. And again, he called out to die. It's better for me to die than to live. That was his thoughts because it says that he, he spoke this within his inner self. Jonah continued to hold fast to his self-justification and anger toward the Assyrians. It seems so far, nothing was going to change his anger that he had. His heart had gotten hard and cold. And, you know, even, in the, even when he was crying, the wording that we saw within the text that he was crying out to the people, you know, uh, back in his in his subconscious or in his in, back in his own thoughts, he was thinking, <laughs> "Yeah, you know, it's going to be the end of it because I know that you're not going to repent." But they did. And when they did, all that did was, was uh, fuel his anger. Because he couldn't, you know, it's like, I can't believe that they repented. And, and furthermore than that, I can't believe that God would go back on His Word what He was going to do. Well, the thing that Jonah forgot or failed to realize was that God is God. He can do as He pleases. 
he could change his mind in a, in a whim if he so desired. And he saw, evidently we saw, that as he uh, had spared Nineveh from destruction, the God that Jonah served and things was an all-knowing, all-powerful God. He knew that their uh, repentance and that their humbling of their self was true. If it, if it wasn't, He would have spared them. But to Jonah, all he saw was that God had told him to plead, to cry upon them, uh, uh, in 40 days you're going to be destroyed, you know, if you don't change. And they did the one thing that Jonah thought they wouldn't do. They changed. And so all it did was fuel his anger now toward the Assyrians or the Ninevites. Look at verse 9. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, Jonah said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. So he's like, you know, yeah, I have a right to be angry and it's my decision and I could be angry even if it means my death. Of course, it was Jonah who was uh, longing to die. It wasn't God's idea to kill him or to, to, to utterly cause death to come to Jonah. It's the second time in this narrative we find God asked Jonah a very penetrating question. The first question was whether his angry toward the Assyrians being spared from judgment was right. That was in verse 4. Did he have a right to be angry because God spared him? Which ultimately... You know, we as the as the readers of the story, we we could literally we could say no. He didn't have any right to be angry. He was a prophet of God. He was supposed to speak what God wanted him to speak to the people. That was his job, and he did that. The results were up to God, but he didn't understand that, or he didn't want to see that. We find now God asked in verse 9 if his, angry, if his anger about the plant dying was justified. We know that when people are hot and they're tired and they're thirsty and frustration is set in and anger often grow more intense. The prophet declared... I do well to be angry. Which literally is, yeah, I got a right to be angry. Jonah was so sure that the Assyrian did not deserve God's grace that he was blinded to his own self-centeredness even when God revealed it to him through the plant and the scorching east wind. These things that God prepared, God prepared to try to show him that you didn't have any right to be angry. And this set the stage for God to show Jonah what compassion was all about. 
the people of Nineveh, the Assyrians, they had changed. They had repented from their wicked ways. It's what it's just they did exactly what Jonah had cried out to them that they would have to do to avoid destruction. Now all of a sudden, Jonah's got his stuff in a wad because God spared him. When he failed to see that they did exactly what God through him had told them to do. We see the compassion. Look at verse 10 and 11. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither makest, madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand people, that's six score, that's 120,000 people, that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. You know, we find in this that God is trying to show him a lesson. Here in verse 10, Jonah's emotional outburst in answer to God's question about his anger and bitterness provided a tremendous object lesson. The prophet cared about the plant that had grown up to cover him during the heat But he didn't work to plant it. He didn't water it. He didn't tend to it. It was a gift of God's grace. But he failed to see that. Jonah cared more about this plant than he cared about the people of Nineveh that were created in the image of God. He cared more about some lame plant that God had prepared that grew up in a night to provide him some shade and then he sent the worm during the day on purpose to smoke the gourd that it died just as quickly as it grew up or withered just as quickly as it grew up and then he sent the strong east hot wind and the sun to shine and to beat down on Jonah. And he did it to teach him a lesson. You know, it seemed like Jonah cared more for a plant that he had nothing to do with it growing, just as he had nothing to do with it dying, than he did for 120,000 people that had turned from their wicked ways and repented and God spared them. Basically, he cared more for the, for the plant that provided him with shade than he did for the 120,000 people that God just spared because they had turned their ways. In the Bible it says, and many have misunderstood the scripture thinking that Nineveh contained only 120,000 people. And they, that actually it was around 500,000 more. Well, the, the trouble is, I mean, yeah. how do we know? 
I mean, they they consider when you look maybe towards you have the host, you got the center of town, right? And then you have the outskirts. Now, if you add all the outskirts together, maybe you come up with 500,000 people. And maybe the, the innermost part was just 120,000 people. I don't know. All I know is, is it says six score. A score is 20. So six times 20 is 100,000. Or 120,000. You know, and maybe. Whether it be 500,000, 120,000, 10,000, 1,000, right. or five, they had changed from their wicked ways, and God spared them. You know, they did what God said. And we find that no matter how, how many it was, uh, and that it made Jonah angry because God spared them. It shows how cold that his heart had really gotten in this. You know, he cared more about the plant than he did people that were created just like he was in the image of God. How could Jonah's priorities have been so skewed or, or messed up? He seemed to care only for himself or at best only for the nation of Israel. The word for cared in the Hebrew is a word that describes compassion. It involved deep feeling and emotion. Jonah expressed deep emotion towards what should have evoked the least amount of care. The plan. He should have been more concerned about the people than about some plan. He should have been concerned more about, about uh, their repentance and how they had now changed and God saw it, God knew it because God spared them than He did about some plant that came up overnight and when the morning came, He sent a worm and the worm uh, bore, devoured into the gourd and killed the gourd and it withered the plant and now all of a sudden uh, you got this hot, direct sun that is right over Jonah's head and he sent this hot east wind to come and even raise the temperature more to just work on Jonah. Christians can likewise become so concerned about their own safety, comfort, well-being that they do not prioritize those who do not have a relationship with Christ. God's calling is not only a privilege, but also a responsibility to take the gospel to those who have not heard it. It's a great commission. It ought to, it, it, and our responsibility as Christian born again believers, it is our responsibility, our job to take 
the gospel to a lost and dying world. Just as Jonah's job was to take the proclamation that God had sent to the people of Nineveh. Same difference. Now, did, was it did it was it any of uh, Jonah's? Did he have anything to do with what God did? No. He was just supposed to do what he was supposed to do. And that should be, that was his main concern. And we as Christians are the same thing. We are, we are called that we are to go and to take the gospel to the world. Well, if we take it to, the, to somebody in the grocery store, and they turn around and tell us to shut our mouths. They didn't want to hear any of that garbage. Now, are we supposed to get mad because God had directed us as being Christians to go and tell somebody and then look at the response we got? No. Our whole thing is we're to tell them. Now, what they do with the information that we give them is between them and God. But between us and God, we're supposed to do what we were supposed to do, which is to tell somebody. And if we get the door slammed in my face, somebody, tell, you know, whatever the case is, we're not just supposed, oh, well, I'm not doing that no more. No, we're supposed to keep on telling people about Jesus. It's just like vacation Bible school. We come in, our job in Vacation Bible School is to be Jesus to these children that God sends our way. He impresses upon the parents and the kids that they want to come and they bring them and they entrust them into our care and we're supposed to be Jesus to them for the two hours we have them for five days, for ten hours, you know, and to tell them, to give them, to explain, and, and, or whatever the case is, Jesus to these children. Now we have no idea who got what out of what we did that week. We pray they all got it. Now we know there are some that already had it. But for the ones that don't, you know, we don't really have an idea. So are we supposed to sit here and say, well, you know, we're not really going to know any results from any of this unless they call and tell us. Are we, uh, I don't think, you know, we just shouldn't even waste our money, time, effort, energy to do this. Well, that's wrong. Because we're supposed to do that. And if nobody gets saved, they don't jump up and down for joy in, in the aisles of our church and say, I got saved! Then, are we supposed to get mad about it? No! We're supposed to, to rejoice in the fact that God let us do what we did for a week. Provided us with the opportunity and the means to do it. Same with... Jonah, whether it's five people, ten people, a hundred people, 120,000, 500,000, a million and a half or whatever, none of that makes any difference. And, and I mean, it's not, it's not worth the point that we, we question it. The point is, is that however they come up with this number, we have to understand that these 120,000 people from what we can gather they turn from their wicked ways and basically they got saved. Alright? So Jonah now he did what he was supposed to do. He went and told them. That was his responsibility. 
His responsibility is not the outcome of this thing. Even though he already had a predetermined thing that he wanted to tell them or, or hope that would happen. You know, he hoped that they would turn around and say, yeah, right. Ha, ha, ha. We are the Assyrians. And we're not afraid of anybody. And would just keep on doing what they're doing and then God would destroy them and Jonah would be happy. He'd probably be exceedingly happy like he was with the gore. But he misconstrued his job and his what God had given him to do. And it he got more bent out of shape over the gourd that he had nothing to do with at all than he did with being happy that God spared these people. He expressed deep emotion toward what should have evoked the least amount of care, which was the plant. God's calling is not only a privilege, but it is a responsibility to take the Gospels to those who have not heard it. You know, it kind of kind of boiled down to would Jonah care more about gourds or souls? We see at, up to this point that he cared more about the gourd than he did the souls. Verse 11. And should not I spare Nineveh? Now this is God speaking. That great city wherein are more than six score thousand people. cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and also much cat. Now we look, we, we could take what he says there and if we wanted to, to try to give an answer, uh, they, we could say that should he be more concerned about the 120,000 that don't know their left from their right, now we could just throw it from the notes I have in my Bible that we could discern that to be the children of Nineveh. Because they don't know their left from their right. Or we could just we could determine this as they were just an illiterate people. And maybe they don't know their left from their right. And really, it has no bearing in what God is trying to show them, to show him. Jonah was concerned for the vine. God was concerned for the people. For the third time in this passage, God asked the prophet a question. He asked him, he says, and should I not spare Nineveh, that great city? God's priorities were people. Some had said, or he said the city had more than 120,000 people who couldn't distinguish their right from their left. Though some have suggested that this indicated 120,000 children. Archaeology suggests Nineveh would not have supported a population large enough to include that many children. The archaeological site of ancient Nineveh would support up to about 175,000 people. Therefore, the reference that they did not know their right from their left is a reference to those who were spiritually 
ethically and morally naive or ignorant. Illiterate. Jonah needed to preach to Nineveh because the people of that city had never heard the message of repentance and faith in the God of the Hebrews. That was the reason that God had sent him there anyway. So that they could hear the message of God or about God. further highlight the absurd absurdity of Jonah's anger and bitterness the Lord added as well as many animals and also much cattle so they had all they had however many people it was they had all their animals if Jonah could not care for people of Nineveh could he not at least care about the livestock in the city? Because God said he was going to destroy everything. So I mean, if God God was putting that question to him and said, well, if you can't care for the people, could you not at least care for the animals out of there? Weren't they more important than a vine that grew up overnight and then perished the next day? Jonah should have compassion on all of God's creation. If he cared for a plant, certainly he should have cared for the people and the animals of Nineveh. Would Jonah care more about gourds or souls? And we find here that the story of Jonah ends abruptly right here. We don't hear it anymore. All the thing we hear is a reference that Jesus talked about Jonah being in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. As he was referencing him being in the tomb three days. We don't, we don't have, there, there's nothing else that it doesn't tell us, you know, the end of the story or what. And I think it's meant to be that way because it poses a question even now to the reader or the one studying the book. Are we supposed to be more concerned about maybe material things or physical things or are, should we not as the people, the children of God be more concerned about the spiritual things of God and the spiritual welfare of people because and the point could be questioned and I believe it is being questioned in this as as seen by the way it ends you know there's no real conclusion that we find here but what we but what we see is that we are supposed to be more uh, the more important thing is supposed to be a person's uh, eternity rather than our own needs or our own uh, physical being or materialistic things or any of that. They don't matter near as much or any as much as does the soul of an individual. If we start placing comparisons between the soul of an individual and whether it was all worth it or not, 
we could go back to our example of Vacation Bible School. We spent all the money, we spent all the time, we spent all the effort, spent all the everything to do it, and, and all the cleanup after, all the preparation beforehand, months planning, and all this stuff, right? And we place it, we place more of the emphasis on what we did than on the spiritual outcome of one of those children. Now which which should we be more concerned with? It's the children. How how that the, they 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 got something that could show them that God loves them, cares for them, wants them to come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus as Satan. It's not like we sit up here and when it's all said and done, it's like, golly, we spent this many thousands of dollars. We spent all this time. We spent all this effort. We did all this decorating. We had to tear it all down. We had to do all of this, all that, blah, 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 blah. And we didn't have one single child come running down the aisle and said that he got saved. Sounds kind of like Jonah. His whole idea, his whole thing was just to tell him. And let God deal with the results and things. The same as us in vacation Bible school, we sure we could turn around and say, golly, was it really worth it all? Was it really worth all that we went through? Sure it is. Because how do we know? We've had children leave our leave our vacation Bible school and a, a few weeks down the road or whatever the case is that they end up getting saved because of our vacation Bible school. You know, we whether in our vacation Bible school we, we water or we plant a seed or we water a seed, or we weed the garden, or we participate in the harvest. None of that. The whole thing is, is that we did it unto obedience of the Lord. Jonah his whole thing was to just do unto the obedience of the Lord. Just do what I tell you, Jonah. That's all you got to concern yourself with. But Jonah had a hard heart to start with. You know, he and 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 this hard heart eased up a little when. He was in the fish's belly. And then when he got to Nineveh and he cried out against the city and, you know, nobody came against him to jump on him or attack him or whatever. But God acted in the, in the hearts of those people that heard his message to where they had to make a decision I'm either going to keep doing what I'm doing and risk destruction or I can I can come in and I can do what this man Jonah says that his God tells us that we need to do and I can be spared if I just turn from my wicked ways. At least, at least he's getting, you know, the people got to realize at least they're getting an opportunity to change. 
God could have said, hey, I'm aware of your evil ways. It's come up, it's been brought up. I mean, we see that in, in chapter 1. It's in the very first verses that the way they've been acting, the way they've been behaving, the things they've been doing, it's come up to the Lord and I'm tired of it. He could have just... And they were gone. But He gave them a second chance. Jonah, he ran from God, being the prophet of God, because his heart was against a people that the Lord wanted him to cry out to. And, you know, he could have literally, God could have done what he wanted. He could have let him drown in the water, but he didn't. He prepared the fish. He could have let the he could have been dissolved in the fish's belly, you know, with the rest of everything else that's being digested. But he didn't. When his heart and things began to change, finally, as Jonah began to pray and began to actually uh, plead unto God, God did what? Heard his voice changed his ways. Put him out on dry ground. May not have been the way he wanted to get there, but he got there. And then told him, look, go to Nineveh. And Jonah got up and went. All of these things, Jonah should have realized how many chances that he had. He had a second chance at being a prophet of God again. He had a second chance of living. He had a second chance in, in the very compassion in a spiritual sense of how his heart was unto the Lord. And he, he got that in the fishing belly. All of these things and then we see that as he goes into the city and he does what he's supposed to do and they turn from their wicked ways from the king all the way down to the least of these and they, they, they do and they change. Now all of a sudden it's like, you know, his ego comes back into picture again. I can't believe God didn't do what he told me he was going to do. No. God told him to tell them that if they didn't change in 40 days, he would do that. You know, Jonah had, had his own mind perceived of what the result was going to be and nothing else was going to satisfy him because of his hard heart toward the people. So it mattered more to Jonah about the gourd than it did to people. The the uh, the people the the gourd meant more than if he didn't care for the people than all the animals that were there. The way that he felt about the people mattered more than the compassion that God had for them. cared for a plant, certainly he should have, should have cared for the people and the animals of Nineveh. Would Jonah care more about gourds or souls? The story of Jonah ends abruptly, abruptly right here. We don't know because of the prophet. Perhaps it ends where it does because Jonah's story has now become our story. I mean, basically, we, we look and in an aspect, I'm not saying we are, but in an aspect, 
we are like a prophet. We are told, go, we're, we've been given what we are to tell people about. And that's about Jesus. And it, you know, we ought to care about them more than, than whatever. But it's not our responsibility how are they, they act. They respond to that. And it's not for us to get down or, or out about because maybe they don't respond the way that we think they ought to. Just like it shouldn't have been, Jonah shouldn't have got down and out because God didn't respond the way that Jonah thought he should. After all, God is God. He can do as He pleases. When He wants, how He wants, where He wants. But if we're being instructed to do something, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And that's what matters. And in our lives, is, 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 is something else supposed to matter more than the lives or the eternity of non-believers? You know, are, are we to... I got this or I got that to do. Well, God says you're supposed to tell somebody. And if He places somebody in your path, you're supposed to tell them. Oh, but they, they may be this culture, this color, or this creed, or, or whatever. So what? What matters most? The souls of people or something else that we have in our lives that's going on. You know, when the story ends so abruptly, right here we have to understand that it is now our story. We are to put ourselves into as a mo into and as a modern day Jonah and tell people that God loves them and He would do anything for them. All they got to do is believe and trust in Him, repent, and be redeemed. I think it ends that way to make us think as readers. Are we, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing or not? What do we care more about? Do we care more about souls or about, you know, whatever? So anyway, we'll stop there. Uh, it's supposed to be hot rest of the week so mind that if you can seem like anything everything I gotta do is in the heat so you know so let's uh, let's pray we can be dismissed this evening Lord we do come thanking you Lord for this day Lord we pray that uh, uh, not only you would impress upon our hearts Lord what we would have to glean from this story of Jonah and what you are trying to impress upon us as an individual and as a church. But Lord, I also pray that you would impress upon the hearts of those that could come and don't come. Lord, it's, it's getting harder and harder to do what we have with the few that we have that are faithful. Lord, we pray that you would just uh, express or impress upon others about their faithfulness. And Lord, we'll give you praise and honor and glory for it. Just keep us safe in this upcoming days and the hot weather and things, Lord, and 
just take care of us. For it's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen.